presents Author Spotlight. Today, Eric and I are joined by author Jeff Gottesfield, and we've got a few questions for him about his new picture books and a few other things. So, Jeff, first of all, thanks for taking the time out to talk to us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Believe me. Oh, great. Well, uh, we have in our collection your your first picture book, The Tree in the Courtyard, the which follows yes. Anne Frank's story and, and the, the history of that tree, which is fascinating. So I, I thought that book was excellent. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And now uh, it, was, it was a real privilege to get the get an early peek at your new picture book that you have coming out, uh, No Steps Behind. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about the book. Oh, it's a it's a it's one of those remarkable, impossible stories that I learned about literally reading this woman's obituary in the New York Times. I mean, if you can imagine a girl raised in Austria in the early 1920s, then her family moves her to Japan and she grows up in Japan and learns to speak absolutely perfect Japanese. Hmm. When she's old enough to go to college, she can't go back to Austria because she's Jewish mm -hmm. and she can't go to school in Tokyo because the universities are not taking young women and certainly not foreign young women. Right. So her parents sent her to Mills College in Oakland, California, and it's an all girls school and she sees a glimpse of how a school could treat women in a different way because Japan is a pretty sexist place. Sure in the 1920s and 30s. She's at Mills, Pearl Harbor happens. She gets cut off from her family entirely. She goes to work for the American War Department while she's at Mills, translating radio broadcasts because the United States has basically put all its Japanese speakers in internment camps. So Beate is one of the 60 Japanese speakers on American soil who's not Japanese. Tokyo is firebombed. She has no idea if her parents are alive or dead. The war ends with the atomic attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. She goes to Washington, talks her way into a job as a translator with the occupation, gets sent back to Japan, finds her parents alive, and then General MacArthur, who is in charge of the occupation, puts her on the committee drafting a new post-war constitution for Japan. Because of her experiences in Japan and her understanding of how rough Japan was on women, she writes an equal rights and family protection clause into the new Japanese post-war constitution. Japanese finally agree with it. And at the age of 22, Beate's efforts have made it possible for Japanese women to have more rights under their constitution than American women have now under the American Constitution. But that's not all. Then the story is a secret for 40 years. Yeah. Beate comes back to the United States. It's a military secret. The United States doesn't want Japanese to think that the United States had anything to do with their new constitution. The Japanese don't want that either. The story breaks in the mid-1990s. Beate goes back to Japan as an old woman and she is mobbed in the streets by Japanese women. She is a heroine there. There's concerts in her honor. The Japanese government gives her a major reward. There's books about her, articles about her, a play about her, a movie about her. This is really one of those remarkable cross-cultural stories where everything had to align in a way for this to happen. And it did. I mean, her Japanese was perfect. I, you know, it's just one of those things that when I was when I was reading this, I just thought, how how have I lived this long and like never heard this story? You know, I mean, it's a fascinating story, start to finish. It's it's um, I mean, it's almost cinematic. It's so unlikely yeah, it's even the things that happen. It's, it's like stranger than movie, fiction. You know, movie waiting to happen. Absolutely. God will have the energy to write it sometime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so how do you take a story like uh, Biete? Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah, Beate, yes. Okay. How do you take a story like hers that involves so much of the destruction of World War II, you know, and her going home and you have to explain what happened to Japan, and you, you do the same thing with the tree in the country. How do you take these 
important stories, but there's a lot of darkness around them. How do you take those and I guess make them accessible for the picture book age? It's a great question. I wish I had a simple answer to it. <laughs> what I can tell you is I did an incredible amount of research. Okay. And and I wrote a ridiculous number of drafts, right. both for the tree and for for this one. The tree, in some ways, was simpler okay. um, than than Beate's story. And then once I wrote it, yeah, I know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I had many many sensitivity readers and cultural consultants read it. I mean, this book has been vetted backwards, forwards, sideways, in every direction. And if there's any key to it, it's that, you know, books like this, they're a, they're, they're a mix of, of words and art. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, the art can do things that words can't do. Okay. So mm -hmm. if, I can, if I can undertell it a little with my words and then pray that the artist is going to add these additional elements that need to be added, that's when these things work. And I happen to have a, uh, my publisher found a fantastic artist. For right. Facebook. She's perfect. And she killed it. She was great. How much of bringing it down to the picture book age then is on her? A lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of it. I mean, I have to, I have to write my text carefully. Mm -hmm. I have to figure out what I'm going to leave out. Mm -hmm. and then much is on the artist. I can tell you that for my work on the tree in the courtyard with Peter McCarty, mm -hmm. we did not have we didn't have a conversation oh, okay. through the process. Not at all. I got one question from him transmitted to me by my publisher. Mm -hmm. I answered my publisher, and Peter and I were not in touch until after the book was published. Okay. With with Sheila, it was not much different from that. We had a little bit of research back and forth. I'm working with a smaller press on that book. So there was an opportunity, I think, for a little more contact. Okay. But largely she took it, you know, she took it and she and she ran with it. Okay. And she she nailed it. Well what is it like then to if you're not working back and forth with them, what is it like to get the maybe the final or at least the proofs and see your words in art for the first time? It's fantastic. Look, <laughs> I have a, I have a book. I have a first, and especially when you're not an artist, right? Which I am not. You know, <laughs> uh, it's like that is far, far out of my ambit. I have a book coming in 2021, which is called 21 Steps. Okay. Uh, and Candlewick is publishing it, and it's about the tomb of the unknown soldier at Arlington National Cemetery and the tomb guards who guard it 24 seven. And it's all told from the perspective of the first unknown. Mm -hmm. And Matt, Matt Tavares is the artist on it. And I just saw his sketches right. for the book. And they are breathtaking. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly when it's something you could not even dream of doing. Right. So that someone is gonna take this amount of time and, and, and be so careful to do illustrations for something I've written, I'm just dazzled yeah. at it every time. It's just, it's just dazzling. <laughs> uh, these, these artists, these artists are great. Right. Great. And Watanta, Watanta's story is amazing because, you know, she's Indonesian and that country was occupied by Japan during, uh, during, during the war. She came to the U.S. six years ago to attend school at the San Francisco Art Institute. I think that's what it was. And she got a green card five years ago. And then her green card came up for renewal this past summer, right Right after she finished the art on my book. And the current administration would not renew her green card. Oh. And they told her she had two weeks to leave the United States. She's back in Jakarta now, which is astonishing, yeah. you know, and, and, and really sort of poignant considering what this, what this, book is about yeah absolutely <laughs> what's interesting to me looking at your bibliography i mean you, you have 
you have such a variety, you know, some, some of the stuff as what we've been discussing today is, you know, it's heavier, it's serious, it's historical. I want to ask you a little bit about some of the, the more lighter things you wrote for some younger kids. So Eric, we're both familiar with your, uh, some of your uh, middle grade level things like uh, the love mints or uh, too many dogs, that sort of thing. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about oh, what my... it's like writing those. How, what's the difference? Gosh, do you know, the, you know those books? Yeah. I, I, I love that. Um, so, so well, I have a serious question about those in a minute, but go ahead. I want to hear. So, you know, here's, here's the thing. You probably grew up reading. Eric probably grew up reading. I grew up reading. I read for fun. Oh, yeah. And, and one fun book led to another, led to another, led to another. There was nothing more fun, nothing more fun than reading. Mm -hmm. And what I think happens too often now is that too many kids don't grow up reading for fun because they don't really have books to read for fun. And you've got a significant cohort now uh, in America, I would say probably in the world, mm -hmm. who are reading below grade level. Okay. So when Saddleback asked me to do these books, they, they gave me a specific mission and, and it just seemed great to do. Uh -huh. They said, come up with stories that are going to be interesting for a fifth grader, but which could be read by someone at the end of first grade. Mm -hmm. You know, that are at a simple reading level so that the, the reading level doesn't get in the way of the story. And I just took that as a challenge. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, so, you know, I spent my life plotting stuff, sure. you know, plotting out, plotting out these stories was, was not hard for me. I mean, you write enough, you spend enough time writing soap operas as I did. It's not hard to find a story. So I would, you know, so I'd come up with a story and then I had to figure out a way to tell it with a really simple vocabulary. Yeah. And that's what I did with all those Red Rhino books. And they're pretty, they're pretty popular. They're well, getting I around. think, you know, just from a professional standpoint, I mean, Eric's our teen librarian, but we, we often find that there's this kind of this is middle area where it's like the kid's a little more advanced than, you know, you, like a little critter or a Berenstain Bears or something like that, but not quite ready for that next level up, the big chapter book. So I think that this series that you did kind of fills this little niche that people are looking for books in and there's just not a lot. Yeah, I, I love it. And the idea is that the kids can have such a good time reading one. Yeah. They're going to go one to another and on to another. And, and then their reading level is going to get better and they're going to move on. Yeah, but uh, you know, for for better or for worse, I'm not sure that there's enough focus mm. on sort of that bottom 50, 60 percent of readers yeah. in the books that are being turned out. They're yeah. they're not designed to win awards; they're just designed to get kids reading. Which is so important. I mean, you you never get to those sort of award winning level books without some sort of middle ground. You know, that's that's yeah. crucial. I can't agree. I can't agree more. Yeah. So it well, was super fun to write this. Well, that's good. Well, I have to ask you, why'd you kill the cat in Cat Whisperer? Oh, my God. <laughs> I, don't I don't know. It made a better, it made, it made a better story. <laughs> you know? No, well, I was certainly I re a surprise. I re I'll tell you that. Yes, I, re I remember that book. So what was funny was that I, uh, I learned some things as I'm writing this. Mm -hmm. What I found was there's like vocabularies yeah. for certain kinds of things that are easier and vocabularies for other kinds of things that are harder. Like the language of romance is actually fairly sophisticated. Hmm. So there's only so many ways that you can say the word love right. and keep it simple. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these books, I, I tried romance and then it was really hard to do. Hmm. You know, so books like Books like Killer Flood and The Code, you know, Cat Whisperer that are that are sort of more action oriented. Yeah. Those tend those tended to be easier. Okay. Interesting. Well, I I couldn't I couldn't let you get off the mic before I ask you these next questions because you know I'm a huge Superman fan and this right. was my first introduction to your work would be Smallville. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your experience writing for the show. Yeah, um, it was, I wrote for the show during its first year, mm -hmm. and it was highly pressurized. Really? Was, yes, because the, the network 
at that point, they needed a hit. Sure. They needed a breakout show. Oh, yeah. And, and this show seemed to be that breakout show. Yeah. So it seemed to be the first every, show they really got any traction on. That's right. They got huge. They got a lot of – well, they had done Dawson's Creek before. That's true. But you know, that, you know, Dawson's had sort of come to the end of its – yeah. The end of its line, and now, now we're do, now we're doing this, mm-hmm. and you know, so you're doing a show that has a lot of mythology, absolutely. Yeah. But our mandate for the first year was to write. I'm going to quote it because uh, it is seared into my memory. We were told to write a closed end action show with emotional underpinnings. Mm-hmm. It means that each episode is supposed to stand on its own, right? And, you know, we were not writing something that was serialized yeah. at the beginning. It got more serialized as the show went on and moved mm-hmm. into three, four, five, six. Yeah. But one. Yeah, there's a clear nothing. change there where it moves from sort of episodic to a more long, long storytelling. Exactly. So, but the, the first year was, was, was not, we were, we were described as, you know, freak, freak of the week. Yeah, yeah uh, I remember that. And, uh, on each episode, and it was not so easy to come up with these. Yeah. And we were scrutinized. We were scrutinized carefully by by the W by Warner Brothers Studio, uh-huh. and then also by the network. And they are separate. Yeah. So okay. There were a lot of notes. Really? There were a lot of notes on outlines. There were a lot of notes on scripts. Okay. Um, it was not as much fun as you might think that it. Could be. Well, it sounds downright stressful. It was. It was really <laughs> stressful. It was a stressed out writers' room, and uh, we all we all worked we all worked very hard. But I will say this about TV in general: TV is pretty stressful. Mm-hmm. Even when I was even when I was writing for Young and the Restless, you know, there's a lot of pressure, and honestly, there's a lot of people who would really love your job. Oh yeah. So, TV is a it's jealous. Mm-hmm. It did wants you have, your time. Did you have more freedom uh, writing the novels that you wrote along with Sheree Bennett? Did you have a little bit more flexibility oh, on how yeah. you use the characters? Yeah, absolutely. Because we had unlimited budgets. You're right. <laughs> and, you know, stop it. You know, stop the thing. Look, and and remember this. You know, the days of Smallville early on were the days before peak TV. Mm-hmm. You know, Game of you know Game of Thrones. Now, you know, a $7 million budget for an episode. Oh, yeah. That's not crazy anymore. Mm -hmm. And early days of Smallville were not $7 million budgets. Mm -hmm. I remember people got, you know, even somewhat apoplectic at, at, you know, 2.5 million Mm -hmm. for an an episode. But when you write a book, you don't think about budget. Yeah. You you just just tell the story however, however however you want to tell it. So, yeah, that was fun. Well, what stands out to me about the ones that you did write was that they they had more of a focus on social issues than the TV show ever really did, or even the other novels in the series. I'm thinking specifically of like Speed, where in that book you guys tackled racism and the racist yeah, that's culture, right. which is that's right. nothing they even touched on the show. So I just I wondered, is that, I mean, it makes sense given the work that we talked about earlier in this interview, some of your more serious, hard-hitting stuff, where clearly you're invested in, in some of these social issues. So I wonder if that's if that was kind of your driving force and getting that into those novels as well. It was it was certainly an opportunity and we were, you know, we were able to do it because there was actually less scrutiny from yeah. DC Comics on this. I mean, oh, really? it wasn't yeah, and it wasn't for lack of I mean, DC was they had a very good editor. They were game, so we were good. We were good to go mm-hmm. with uh, with this. It wasn't for lack of trying during that first year uh, at Smallville. Uh, mm-hmm. We you know tried a little bit on the uh, on the social side, but um, I could never push a story through yeah, yeah. that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which was look. Most TV shows would be glad to be as unsuccessful as Smallville was. Thing ran for what ten seasons. Ten seasons, yeah, hard to believe. <laughs> they were they were right. I was wrong, but we we <laughs> we did try. We did try. Well, that's good. Well, listen, Jeff, you've been really generous with your time, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, can you tell us when No Steps Behind will be available? Yeah, it's uh, it's going to come out. I think we're a year from March of twenty twenty. We were originally scheduled for December of twenty nineteen. 
and then decided as a team that we wanted to do a different kind of cover oh, okay. for it. And so the cover art is now being reconceptualized. And with Sheila in Indonesia, it's a little bit trickier. Yeah, I bet. But I have, be. yeah, so I have that book coming in early 2020. I have a book called The Christmas Mitzvah, which is also based on a, on a true story, which comes late in 2020. Same and level? Then, yep, is it also same, a okay. also, also a picture book. Okay, yep. all right, great. Picture book, and then 21 Steps comes uh, to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Oh, That'll be in like October, November, 2021. Oh, that's great. And if people want to find you online, where's the best place to do that? Oh, Jeff Gottesfeld Writer is my is my website. It's, it's easy to find me. Okay, great. Well, thanks again for talking to us. It's been great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Keep up the good work, guys. Thank you. All right, be well.